Hello and welcome to Ratio Dialogue with me, Jonas Grafström. Today we are going to have an English episode with Professor Dan Klein from George Mason University and fellow here at the Ratio Institute. Today we will talk about Adam Smith's rebuke of slavery. It will be a very exciting, I promise. So how should a person that is interesting in Adam Smith approach him? Uh, they should see the first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, as a much broader statement, development of a moral outlook and see the wealth of nations as sort of a, an appendix to that, nested underneath that umbrella and another branch of moral philosophy. Yeah, and I think uh, most people uh, kind of perceive the Wealth of Nation as the main work, but uh, as you say, I think it's uh, right there in the end that they are thinking about writing an appendix about a few of uh, Wealth of Nations, but you know, m maybe later, and he did. Yep. Um, so, um, what uh, impact did Smith have in his lifetime? Large. Um, he, this book was quite successful when it came out in 1759, so he thereby established himself as a moral philosopher. It was well received by at least three very warm reviews when it came out. Um, so he was, he was greatly respected and seen as a leading light of the Scottish Enlightenment, which itself was seen as like a major mountaintop of the cultural landscape in Europe. And then when the wealth of nations came, that had a tremendous impact right away and really affected how people think about good government and how governments should move forward. Uh, how come uh, came Scotland became the kind of this kind of beacon of enlightenment? That's an interesting and big question. Yeah, big, yeah. Um, I think that the the kind of um, de-elevation of the political class in Scotland after the Union of 1707, where the Scottish Parliament is essentially dissolved and they move to London, leaving other intellectuals like Smith kind of like high in Scotland as moral leadership. Have uh, you ever thought about buying an original copy of the Wealth of Nations? No, I've never thought about buying an original copy. I like to write in my books, so <laughs> I'm not even sure what I would do with an original copy. Delightful to have under glass at home. But yeah, I can see the point not writing in it. It would be uh, <laughs> quite a waste. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, so we, I read uh, another of your interesting paper, and this time about uh, Adam Smith's uh, 1759's rebuke of the slavery. Yes. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. So there are two sentences that you say mm -hmm. Smith uses to re rebuke the slave trade. And you told me that you wanted to read them out loud and we will put them on screen also. It's always yeah. nice to hear them. Sure. Um, so the two sentences come when he's talking about how different states of society develop or nurture different sets of virtues. Yeah. And in the rude and barbarous nations, the respectable virtues of self-command are foremost. And he points to the Native Americans and then to the Africans to illustrate this. So in the rude and barbarous countries, um, it's the respectable. In the more civilized, it's the amiable, the softer, gentler, more compassionate virtues. And so he gives this long description of uh, the Native Americans and uh, how, how much fortitude they show. And then, if, and then the paragraph continues, I'll read this. The same contempt of death and torture, he talked about that at length with the Native Americans, the same contempt and torture prevails among all other savage nations. And here now are the two sentences. There is not a Negro from the coast of Africa who does not, in this respect, possess a degree of magnanimity which the soul of his sordid master is too often scarce capable of conceiving. Fortune never exerted more cruelly her empire over mankind 
than when she subjected those nations of heroes to the refuse of the jails of Europe, to wretches who possess the virtues neither of the countries which they come from nor of those which they go to, and whose levity, brutality, and baseness so justly expose them to the contempt of the vanquished. So he's referring to the slave traders here who show neither the virtues of Europe, let's say Britain, which would be the more amiable because it's the more civilized countries, nor the respectable virtues of the countries they go to, like Africa, the respectable virtues. And uh, there are, he calls them refuse of the jails of Europe and wretches whose levity, brutality, and baseness expose them justly to the contempt of the, of the vanquished. So he's endorsing this contempt which the enslaved peoples feel towards their oppressors. So it's a very strong rebuke of the slavers. Um, he continues on with this con contrast between the refined and amiable countries versus the more rude and respectable countries. And what he goes on to say about Europe is that the French and the Italians are the most refined and civilized in this amiable way, whereas the Brit Britons are less so. They're more in the respectable camp. And in this way, I feel he's, oh, look, he's like calling out to his British readers a certain national invidiousness, like comparing the Britons to the Europeans, the continental Europeans with their refined manners. And He's saying, look, if you think you're above them with your more respectable virtues, just think of how much above you are these nations of heroes who are being oppressed. So he's getting the British readers to sort of sympathize and identify with the victims of this oppression. So I think it's an extremely powerful rebuke. Um, and it's, it's early for this kind of strong rebuke strong rebuke, 1759. It's not as though there hadn't been other condemnations of slavery, um, but this was a very notable one that sticks out if, if, if you're reading attentively uh, in this, you know, in book. book yeah. yeah, he doesn't really go into day-to-day kind of -day political issues that much. No, not in this book at all. In fact, that's one of the only political issues he really comments on directly in this book. Yeah, for that then maybe suicide or something like that. He does have remarks about suicide, suggesting that it should not be um, criminalized, but he's very much against suicide yeah. on a moral, you know, at a moral level. Yeah, but uh, that could be like, you know, don't minding other people's stuff as much. Yes, really. yes, in both cases. But uh, I think he right, it's kind of between the lines almost, this slavery thing, even though it's quite powerful in the book. It's, you know, as uh, you said in the article, quite late in the chapter and... Yes, yes. And he goes on to say that <clears throat> custom and fashion cannot corrupt the general character of morals. In other words, it can never be customary or fashionable for neighbors to rob and cheat their neighbors. So there can't be a general endorsement of, uh, 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 of injustices like that. But he says it can, however, moral sentiment, can, moral judgment can be perverted deeply in particular usages where you've somehow s s confined a set of neighbors that you can oppress. And the example he gives when he talks about this explicitly, is infanticide yeah. in ancient Greece. So that's killing babies for... Killing, <laughs> killing babies, yeah, exposing babies that you don't want, essentially. Uh, but when he does this, it's clear, I think, that the example he actually gave just, just a couple of pages earlier of the slave trade is the much more relevant current contemporary, urgent malpractice, misdeed that is going on among, you know, the readers of his book. 
not infanticide in ancient Greece. So he doesn't say that very explicitly, but I think it's there between the lines. Hmm. So what impact did this have on the early anti-slave movement? I think it did have a significant impact. I think Smith was appreciated as somebody uh, supporting that cause and advancing that cause, that is to say the, the, the abolition of the slave trade and of slavery in general. Um, <clears throat> it was quoted, these two passages, in a number of early items, including a 1764 pamphlet, which quoted it twice in full. It was also quoted by Benjamin Rush, in the United States in some anti-slavery work. It was also quoted and reproduced in full in the famous um, honor roll uh, and history that Thomas Clarkson wrote about the whole abolitionist movement. That work came out in 1808. Clarkson was deeply involved in the society for affecting the abolition of the slave trade and which culminated in the 1807 Abolition Act. Um, so it was clearly noted, and Clarkson notes that there's a tradition of Scottish thinkers and professors who were against slavery and includes, he mentions Hutchison, Smith, John Millar, William Robertson. He also could have mentioned Gershom Cromichael, but um, that was a more obscure early Latin work that perhaps Clarkson didn't know about. Probably not, I guess. <laughs> yeah, he comes before Hutchison. Uh, but uh, so Smith is maybe not uh, that known for the anti-slavery issue today. Well, why is that? Or is it because all the other thing is maybe um, more yeah. relevant and maybe yeah. speaks more to our time? Yeah, I agree. He's not been. This has not been highly noted. Um, maybe because of the difficulties of the presentation in his text, it kind of comes in an odd place. You don't really see what's going on at the moment. He doesn't. Explain you know, explain clearly what he's doing and why, how it pertains to the final lesson about particular usages uh, and their perversions of our moral sentiments. So it's maybe just a, partly the difficulty of the text. Yeah, it's not really a chapter that is called Why Slavery is Bad. That's right. He addresses slavery again in The Wealth of Nations, and there he doesn't fulminate against its injustice the same way maybe because he figures he had already done that. And I think maybe he wants to persuade people, you know, he wants in a way to persuade the aristocrats in his works that it's not economical. It's not to, to the good of anybody, even the slaveholders, to have slavery. And we should be trying to get rid of it. So he makes more of, if you like, an economic argument against it in The Wealth of Nations. Uh, Smith he writes about how future generation will regard the horrible blots upon our current civilization. Uh, so what do you think uh, Smith would say today is our horrible blots? I'm not sure that there's anything comparable to slavery that's going on in a modern nation like Sweden or the United States. I suppose drug prohibition kind of comes to mind, locking people in cages for, you know, doing things that... Um, generally speaking, would have been legal in Smith's day. Um, <clears throat> but in general, I do think we have a governmentalization of social affairs in many, many ways, and including um, the control of commerce and industry uh, that I think he would object to. So I think there would be no shortage of things he would object to. Yeah. But I don't think there's anything as horrible, certainly as slavery, uh, why did Smith uh, consider TMS, the fear of moral sentiments, better than both nations? He did say that uh, this was a su much superior work to the wealth of nations. He said that uh, to a friend of his who, quoted, who quotes it, who, who, might, who, who remarks on it. Um, why? I can only speculate. Um, I, th I do think this is a much subtler and broader and richer and more esoteric and allegorical work than The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations is sort of easy to understand by comparison. 
I just think he really was proud and happy with, you know, the sort of depth and subtlety of this work, dealing with the subtler issues of the soul and, you know, human well-being and so forth. Yeah. Morals. Indeed. So some uh, uh, final questions, usually we take overrated, underrated again. <laughs> so, yeah. so Führer with Brad Pitt. I like that movie. I like 1917 better, by the way. Yeah. Um, there's a note, there's a moment in that movie, which I've quoted, maybe that prompted your question, where um, Brad Pitt says, philosophy is peaceful, history is violent. Um, I like that moment. Uh, overrated or underrated on uh, the Scottish Enlightenment? I'm very big on the Scottish Enlightenment. I, uh, on the topic of the Scottish Enlightenment, I do think it's worth dehomogenizing it. Um, there are different trends you can see. One, the one I favor more is the Hume Smith, you could say John Millar trend. Yeah. Another is the Thomas Reed, Dugald Stewart, Adam Ferguson, Kames over time, Lord Kames trend, which I don't, which I think less of, uh, generally speaking, um, and I do think they're different in significant ways. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, what do you think about Anders Schydenius? I think he's great. I read a good portion of net gain it came out in 1750 something yeah, i think so yeah um and it's very good market economics shadanius was also a advocate of freedom of speech freedom of the press and other other developments like that yeah he's a great figure and uh swedes should be very proud of him yeah of finnish swedes or whatever he was from we claim him <laughs> swedish finland yeah, yeah. Did. Uh, last, uh, so overrated or underrated, uh, the wealth of nations? Um, <clears throat> well, I think I agree with Smith about this one being the superior work, as much as I love the wealth of nations as well. Um, maybe we should say that, you know, this one still needs to be more appreciated by many people. Yeah. Indeed. Well, thank you very much, Dan. It was a pleasure again. Thank you. And thank you for listening. <laughs>